Joining us is a lady who is no uh, stranger to the Observer, Tabaki MP and UNC Shadow Minister of Education, uh, Ms. Anita Haynes Allen. Pleasant good evening to you, Ms. Haynes Allen. Good evening, Mikey K. How are you? How are you doing this evening? Good, good. Keeping up the fight. And thank you so much for taking time out to join us here this evening on The Observer. No uh, problem. Uh, the new school term starts off in September. And, of course, many challenges uh, as far as many of the parents speaking about the amount of money for supplies and uh, things like books and pens and what have you. Uh, and you've been looking at this for quite some time. Um, you know, when we were looking at the um, return to physical school um, after the COVID-19 pandemic, I had raised the issues around the high cost of back to school um, and, and what that meant then. Since the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, we've seen the escalating prices of everything, you know, across the board. We have seen, you know, increases in food prices, etc. And the government in 2022 made an announcement by the budget statement that they would be looking at um, the editions of the textbooks so that schools will have to use textbooks more with, you know, more than one per year and so that you wouldn't have parents having to buy like a new edition as they go forward so that siblings could share or that you can buy secondhand textbooks and whatnot. And what we're seeing now is this appears to be just another announcement that was not followed by an implementation because, you know, parents are looking at it. The cost is becoming very difficult for them to absorb. The access to the $1,000 book grant, I mean, I raised it in the media review and I will raise it again um, as we go into another financial year and we have another budget statement as the parliamentary term reopens. The fact is there was a very short window. It was an online application and therefore a lot of the people who were probably most in need were unable to access the application for the grant. And, you know, I raised this in the parliament, I raised it with the minister, and here we are again, where you are presenting, the government is saying that they're presenting a solution to a problem, but it's not a real solution because the people who need it the most aren't able to access it. And that's what we are seeing playing out right now before our eyes. Yeah, the government made it quite clear that the grant was offered to households with an income of $10,000 or less. And yeah. they have been, people have been receiving notification, according to what the government report is, notification of the, fir the first phase of the, one of the grant distributions. And uh, they said that the, the education ministry said those who provided the bank account information will be paid via direct deposit, while those without bank account information will be paid via a separate check in the coming weeks. Now, the initiative on the surface sounds great, but how are we to, uh, so sure that these monies will be actually spent on school supplies? Well, agreed, but you know, I mean, further to that, when we looked at the numbers at the media review, the book grant was supposed to service according to the estimates provided by the Ministry of Finance in, um, in the, in the financial in the budget statement, it was supposed to service some sixty five thousand persons, right, households. And we had at the time earlier this this year, um, only about you know fifteen thousand applicants or some or, or, or thereabouts. And so I asked the question as to well, why was it undersubscribed? And the minister said, well, usually you know people. The, the number of persons who say they are in need or appear to be in need, they don't present the information, so they don't pass the means test, basically. But what we are again seeing playing out in front of us right now is that, the, that we have not properly reached our target audience. Now, I agree with you, there is the other thing um, about, you know, that we have to hope that parents are responsible and do their due diligence and use this money for school supplies and textbooks and, and whatnot. I mean, that though, I would not put the blame on the government for that because, I mean, that is policing households and, and you know, an extent that will be an overreach. However, I can say this though, you should be able to put monitoring systems in terms of persons who access the grant and 
whether or not their children are equipped with the necessary supplies. And you could do this by using the school social worker initiative so that they can see who has school supplies, who has their textbooks, etc., and create the truest sense of an all-of-government approach. That if you are accessing government funding, that your child should be well equipped when they come into the school system come September, yeah. and that's a simple enough monitoring system. Yeah, but, but, but I think also it could have been similar to that of the food card system, where the government, of course, uh, guaranteed that the money is being spent on food. Well, you see, the thing with it being like the food card system is that there would be a, it would have been a tendering process to particular bookstores and whatnot. And so that could take us into some bureau, bureaucratic orders that, you know, may have been a little bit, because how, how are you suggesting where, you know, or, or these particular systems in place? So, I, I mean, I understand what you're saying, um, but I think in terms of, Efficiency it can be monitored at the school system come September as well. Yeah, I, I mean, at, at this point in time, I mean, when you look at what's happening with the crime situation in the country, there are many people who are weighing in, many stakeholders who are weighing in on the issue and saying, listen, first we have to look at the entire system, uh, the way our children are being raised, the way they interact in school, the education system. I mean, we have the prime minister in the height of the pandemic saying that 2,000 plus of our students fell through the cracks. I mean, they could future leaders, uh, you know, future people who definitely could have made a positive contribution to Trinidad and Tobago. Where are we at now? When you look at the C exam results and what have you, are just too many of our children being left behind? Absolutely. I mean, the, the SCA exam, when you take a careful analysis of it, we have a significant portion of students who are scoring below the 50% mark. So much so that we are now quantifying how many students score below 30%. Um, I think we only, you know, the, the fact is more than half of the students who wrote the SEA exam scored below 50%. If you take that as face value, it means that half of our students who are entering the secondary school system have not attained a competency level necessary to successfully start a secondary school education. We also have this, this issue of the students who score below 30%, that they are by and large put into certain schools. Those schools are then not equipped properly to then deal with students who are scoring below 30% and therefore, you know, far beneath what is required to participate in a secondary school education. And if you are going to do that, then the ministry ought to equip these schools with, again, guidance counselors, um, school social workers, and as well as you know, a retraining of the teachers so that they are equipped for what they are, what what they will have to be dealing with come September. Sure. And you know, you're not seeing these proactive measures. You are seeing reactionary measures. And not only are the measures reactionary, they are by and large cosmetic, and so not any real treatment to the issue, the situation that we're facing. And it is borne out by the exam results. So I mean, by the time we get to CSEC results, you see any the same thing, you're seeing math and English scores, the majority of students not getting a full um, CSEC certificate because they're not passing math and English. Yeah, and I agree with you. I mean, it seems as though it's a system just, uh, you know, pushing uh, children through. And at the end of it, the end result is not something that they can actually have uh, that's going to help them at least compete on the global market or even secure any sort of jobs here. So, so then what are we looking at? I mean, all of this ties into something where uh, we are simply having a society where too many of our young people are either flying out with a brain drain or the fact of the matter, the ones that stay here simply cannot meet up to the standards that are required in order to get into good positions. Correct, correct, and 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 I mean, you. This is not a problem that we could not have anticipated. When you look at the exam results, when you look at the statistics going as far back as 2017, 2016, the decline started in 2017, which is before the COVID-19 pandemic. And so they tried to put all of the blame on the pandemic, but what you saw come when this administration took office in 2015 is you saw a, system, a systemic, systematic dismantling of things that were in place 
that bolstered the education system. You saw the removal of the um, the the component that that would score so that you have the during the term rather than facing an exam at the end of the term you were assessed throughout the term and therefore you were judged your competency over time which assisted a number of students showing that not everybody's an exam taker not everybody's a test taker but they can demonstrate the competency over the the coursework component of it they they removed that you saw the removal of of the, the call centers that allow for, for, for student assistance by a, with a partnership would be mobile. And so there were a number of things that were in place that were working. The homework centers were shut down. The, um, the, the, the teacher's training was also shut down. And so, I mean, we, you, whatever you, your input into the system are, that is what you will reap. And this government came in in 2015 and said, we have to make cuts and made significant cuts to the education sector in the first instance. And now they're trying to spend more money when in fact it is their dismantling of things that work that we're, we're getting the results of right now. And it is very sad, but I do hope that the population takes notice that when you have incompetent management at the top, it will impact you in the long run, and that is what you're seeing right now. Yeah, and again, looking at the fact of the whole um, teaching fraternity, uh, you mentioned, of course, earlier this month, uh, to resolve the salary delays now, you call out to the Ministry of Education. Uh, you said that in November of last year, you raised the issue of late payment to substitute yeah. teachers, and, and you highlighted this. I mean, why is this an issue um, you know, when, it, when it comes to paying teachers? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the other thing too. I mean, I mean, you know, it's not just an accounting situation. It is a matter of human dignity. The, the future of Trinidad and Tobago is in the hands of teachers. The future of Trinidad and Tobago, whether you like it or not, it is in the hands of teachers because they train, educate, mold our children. And then you cannot find the decency to pay them on time. I'm talking these substitute teachers and these ECCE center teachers. They were, some of them would have, went months without payments. You know, some of them reaching out to me three and four months without payments and that they have to write and call and face a runaround to get their salaries and this is money that they worked for. And I mean, I found it to be, if the Ministry of Education cannot do something as simple as keep their accounts in order. How can we expect them to solve problems of the issues we're facing with the curriculum? How can we move over to an education system that creates a total prison education system that creates students who are equipped for the jobs of the future and they can't solve payroll issues? I mean, it shows us why we're in the issues, in the, facing the issues we are today. Yes, yeah, student transport, um, owing as far as public utility companies, and the list goes on and on. So you ask yourself, if a large chunk of the budget is being allocated to the Ministry of Education, why are these problems happening? I mean, why is it, it seems to be a recurring factor. Correct, correct. That is exactly what it is. And so that you're seeing, again, simple day-to-day -day management tasks they are failing at. If you can't solve small problems, we cannot expect you to solve big problems, and that, that's just a fact. And of course, the former education minister, Dr. Tim Gopi Singh, under the People's Partnership, made it clear that there were so many, and I think you mentioned it a little earlier on there, so many programs that were there that were just simply scrapped, uh, I, I guess basically just for political reason. But now, now what are we faced with? I mean, we have young people. Uh, where's that sense of hope, that sense of purpose, that sense of belonging moving forward? What is going to happen? Because, I mean, when you look at the crime statistics, when you look at the fact that people are just simply doing this thing bold and so confidently just going out there and committing crime, and we talk about the young people and the influence that many of this many of them would be influenced, of course, to be taking the negative path, then what are we looking at here if these programs are not there to help our young students? We are looking at a Trinidad and Tobago that we will not be able to recognize in as short a time as 10 years from now. That is what we're looking at, an unrecognizable TST in, in 10 years or less. 
Yeah, I mean, that, where does that put us? I mean, that's a serious, that, that's serious. I mean, really. Absolutely. Good. No, but I mean, listen, we, the, the numbers are as they are. Mm-hmm. And it's during the pandemic, we have by our joint select committee report, we know that some um, 47,000 plus students never accessed online learning. About a year and a half later, by a, a Freedom of Information application made by a media house, we found out that there were some um, uh, 2,000 1,800 there about students who dropped out of the secondary school system and a further 800 or 900 who had dropped out of the primary school system. And these are at dropouts, so they are not attending at all. And then there are persons where numbers that we don't have, which are constructive dropouts, so that they aren't able to attend the majority of the time. Or they may be there one term and not be there another term. They may be not taking exams and whatnot. So those are the numbers we're facing. If we are hearing parents tell us as well that they can't afford the textbooks and the school uniform and the, the cost of going back to school, then you will get another number of persons who, for financial reasons, now are unable to send their children to school. And these are the numbers that we have. I guarantee you the numbers that we do not have will probably cause even more alarm um, to be raised. And that is where we're at right now we're also seeing rather than making any targeted intervention we're utilizing this data to make targeted interventions utilizing data coming into the ministry of social development to make targeted interventions we have excuses and cosmetic changes and that is why i say we will be facing an unrecognizable trend out of Tobago. because though even though we have the fact we don't have all the facts, but the fact that we do have is pretty startling. We have all of this in front of us. What we are still being presented with are excuses and cosmetic changes. Yeah, and, and, and that's just where we are. And, and the end result, of course, is, is an issue of crime in this country. And you're right, with all these excuses, and they say, you know, excuses are the tools of the incompetent. So you would get that. But when you look, for example, I mean, we are known to be one of a follow fashion sort of society sometimes taking the most negative things from whether it be North America or Europe. But let's, let's zero in on Finland here. We're talking about basically what is recognized and, and, and you know, seem to be deemed as the crown jewel of education in Finland. You know, while, while most education systems are centered on evaluation with frequent testing, Finland's 100% state-funded system goes very much against the grain. So, so forget about the SCA. That's not going to happen. For a start, these children in Finland, they don't start formal education until they're seven, compared to with four or five, at the age of four or five in most countries. Uh, and so there is no C exam. There's, there's no constant testing. It's a totally different system. Why is it that many of these things are not implemented here in our system? You see, because what we've done is we've um, kept our system the same from our colonial era. Um, even without just looking at the, fin uh, the system in Finland, we've had great minds pass through this country. What we have to start to do, you know, I mean, we're heading into August, August, we'll celebrate our independence um, on, on August 31st. But what we've not seen is any sort of independent thinking as to what type of education system will work best within our society. How are we training and, and educating our young citizens in a way that they can be not just workers, but entrepreneurs, that they can contribute to a regional economy, a global economy, and obviously our local economy as well. How are we harnessing things that are unique to Trinidad? How are we making things, you know, are we looking at, at our education system as a way to build up our citizens? And we haven't seen any of those things. We've not seen any innovative thinking. We've not seen any creative thinking. And I mean, I'll venture to say we've seen very little thinking at all. What we've yeah. done is we've taken a system that we've inherited how many ever decades ago, and we just kept it going. So we keep putting fuel into the system, fuel into the system. And there's been no thinking about whether or not that system works for us at all. And I mean, that is, again, where we're at. And that is across the border. That is beyond just the education system. It is the health system. It is how we manage our economy. It is even our national security system. We have yeah. put no thought into what is going to work best for 
Trinidad and Tobago and how do we implement that. Right. We have just been trudging along and, and, and marking time without making any real advancement. Yeah, and I, I, I agree with you, really and truly. One would think by now we would be uh, understanding what it means to be out there in the leader, you know, leading in some sort of market, having our own personal niche, but you're right, just simply biding time. Now, I, I want to get to an issue here with you, and of course, that is the politics. The yes. po political leader of the United National Congress, the Honorable Kamala Prasad Bissessa, made it quite clear on the platform um, a few months ago. She said that we are all UNC members, and there's room for all. Members and supporters of all slates, this coming out from the internal elections, supporters of all slates must now move on together for the greater good of the party and ultimately our country. Supporters of both slates must now work together. All anger, any bitterness or hurt should be forgiven. Where do you stand on that? I mean, absolutely. Look, um, the campaign that we ran on is a stronger UNC for a stronger TNC. And that remains true. I do believe that the United National Congress, and I've always believed it, is the best vehicle to take Trinidad and Tobago forward. And now our job is to figure out how to get the United National Congress elected into government to take Trinidad and Tobago forward. And so I have always been Team UNC, and I continue to be Team UNC, and we continue to try to find a way forward because our country cannot continue on the, going down the road that we are going down right now. Yeah, of course, she added that we must now come together in the real battle, that of unseating the government in the upcoming general elections. And she says, once we move forward together as one party with one common goal, we will be successful in our undertakings. Are you fully committed to that? Are you on board 100% with that? I have always been on board. What you had was an internal election where certain positions were available, and I applied for those positions, one of those positions. And so, therefore, it, I was never off board with that. I've always been on board with the mission of unseating the, the PNM. Yeah, I, I think what's interesting, she also said that uh, it is not for her to decide the future of anyone. Uh, the future is in their hands. And saying that, I want to expand just a bit before I close off with you. Um, mm -hmm. Let's say if you're not selected, or I, I don't know if you put in your nominations as the case may be for uh, whatever seat the case may be. And if you're not, are you still there with that level of commitment to ensure that your party becomes and forms the next government? Absolutely. Um, most will remember that I would have started my work within the United National Congress long before I had a seat, and I will continue my work with the United National Congress, whether or not I have a seat. I've made it very clear throughout the internal campaign and, and, and in every conversation that I've had. My goal entering political life is not, has always been national development, but there are ways for me to contribute to national development that are outside of politics, and I have no problem exp exploring those goals as well. And so I've never been one of those persons who believe that uh, the seat in Parliament belong to me. I've always believed that the work, the service, is something that I'm willing to do, and that is why I put my name forward. And I would only take my name out of the hat if I'm unwilling to serve. Excellent. And, and your interaction with your fellow colleagues who are on your slate, uh, perhaps if you encounter one that says, listen, I, I still feel a sense of bitterness, I feel a sense of hurt, how do you deal with that situation? I think my colleagues have all understood exactly what we were applying for and that the position, you know, we want to, in, as in anything, I mean, we face general elections where we put ourselves up as UNC candidates and, and the UNC has not been victorious and we did not leave Trinidad and Tobago. So the same thing, you put yourself up for a position on the UNC NAPEX and you were unsuccessful, that doesn't mean you will leave the USC. You understand? Um, that is the way democracy works, the majority rules, and you continue to do work, and I think everybody understands that, because we've all been involved in electoral politics at different levels for quite some time. All right. I want to thank you so much for taking time out, uh, Ms. Haynes-Allen. Thank you so much again. Best of luck to you and your entire team, and keep up the good work.